this semester we'll be looking at art in many different genres. But before we even get there, what is art? When we talk about art, what do you think of? Do you think of paintings on the walls of a museum, sculptures? Well, don't forget, art includes many different genres from television ads to print ads, music, dance, architecture are all different forms of art. Here you can see the quote I have, all art is quite useless. That's by Oscar Wilde, the author of the portrait, the picture of Dorian Gray, who Oscar Wilde himself is considered an artist, but he believed art didn't have to do anything but be aesthetically pleasing. So what is art? A particular way of saying something or producing an effect in the observer. On page 20 of your textbook, your author states, Art reflects the unchanged human characteristics in inescapable terms and helps us to understand the beliefs of cultures, including our own, and to express the universal qualities of humans. One thing to remember, art is not elitist. Don't think that you have to have a higher level of knowledge to be able to talk about or appreciate art. Most people, when they hear the term art, think, oh, I don't know anything about that. But you do. You know whether you like something or not, and you can explore those reasons. Usually that will lead you into the formal and principal elements you need to review a work of art. You'll also hear the term aesthetics often in this course. What is aesthetics? Aesthetics is the study of the nature of beauty and art. Usually it's comprised of epistemology, ethics, logic, and metaphysics. But first, why do we study art? What is the point? Well, maybe we study art just because we enjoy it. Maybe it reaffirms our values and our beliefs. When you're standing in the middle of a beautiful Gothic cathedral, maybe you understand and feel what Abbot Suge was, was exploring when he created that genre of art new areas of intellectual inquiry, or we look at it because of a distinct set of skills. Art often provides a record of past events. We know what happened in the past because cultures tend to create artwork that reflects the values, the ideas, and even provides a record of what went on. It helps us to question our own ideologies and customs, and it can be an avenue of intellectual communication. You can watch a dance performance and not have to understand a specific language to get the meaning and the message from the art. So what makes art art? Why do we consider one thing art and not another? And this is what I want you to start exploring with this lecture is thinking about how and why you value art. Is it the ability to adequately represent something? Is it the meaning within the work? Could that be the meaning from the creator or the meaning that the viewer sees when they look at the work? The technical degree of difficulty when creating a work. How many times in your life have you said, that's not art, a three-year-old could make it? What about the emotions it provokes? Do we have to have an emotional response to artwork for it to be art? Does it have to be beautiful? And then whose idea of beauty? Many idea, the idea of beauty changes from generation to generation, from culture to culture. Does a work of art have to be valued by a community or a culture? What about the location of it? Just because it's in a more developed area, does that make it art? Or what about the creator's claim, statement, what the artist was trying to say within the work? These are all things to consider when we're looking at art. One of the Hard and fast rules about defining what is art is there is no hard and fast rule. So then what makes art good art? What makes one better than another? Here we're going to start exploring different art pieces. And I want you to start with, is it art or is it not? Is it good art? And you could start with just with, do I like it? And then think about why you like it or not. When we formally analyze art, it's not expressing our personal opinions about it, but that could be a good way to start. If you're looking at the image here and you're just like, hmm, I don't like it. Well, why? What don't you like about it? Or what do you like about it? And you'll see in the upcoming lectures that by starting this way, you're then going to get the specific vocabulary to be able to talk about the art formally. 
So let's look at some of these examples. Here we see a work. When you first look at this one, what are your first reactions? Do you like it? Do you not? Some scholar, students have said that there's too much going on in the work. Other scholars have said that they enjoy it because there seems to be so much going on. Things we could talk about, the color palette, blacks, whites, and grays, all intentionally used by the artist. I often say in class, what do you think? Do you want this hanging over your couch? Meaning, do you like it that much? Do you want it where most people will be able to see it? And then we can also look at the meaning behind the work. This is Pablo Picasso's Guernica, 1937, Oil on Canvas. This was actually painted as a response to the April 26, 1937 bombing of the town of Guernica. Um, this is a town in northern Spain. It was during the Spanish Civil War, and actually German and Italian warplanes came in and bombed the town. The meaning and the message behind this work is supposed to reflect the ravages of warfare on the everyday citizens. The light bulb up in the upper, um, the upper left background, that's supposed to represent the bombs. You can see the figure on the far right, almost screaming in pain and agony. In the left background, you see what looks like a bull, the traditional symbol of Spain. And then right below the bull, you see a mother holding a dead child. So within this work, Picasso is exploring this idea and trying to show the horrors and the ravages of war on the everyday citizen. Does that change how you view or value the work? Here we have another piece. When you look at this one, what is your response? Good art, bad art. Do you like it? Now we can look at this one and we can see that it's made up of tiny, tiny, tiny little dots. This is a technique called pointillism, where each dot is placed with the tip of a paintbrush. So if we value art because of technical skill, this did take a level of technical skill and a lot of time to create. Yet look at the subject matter. What does it look like? It's a guy sitting on the toilet. In fact, this is called Sunday on the Pot with George. The artist is unknown and it is acrylic on canvas. So if we say we value art because of the technical skill, well, this one still has technical skill in it, but do you want it hanging over your couch? Maybe, maybe not. Do you want it hanging in your bathroom? Perhaps. How about this work? This is one most of you are probably familiar with. This is Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, 1503 to 1505, and it's an oil on panel. Is this good art or bad art? Most of us reflexively are going to say it's good art. Why? Because most of us have been taught that it's good art, that the Mona Lisa is one of the upper echelon, the standard that others re try to retrieve, or achieve, not retrieve, that they try to achieve. Yet, is it good art? Do you personally like it? Or do you just know the cultural value and significance of it, that this was, a very, was and is a very important work to most of Western culture? I mean, if you look at her herself, she's a little bit creepy, right? If you look, she has no eyebrows, and her hair is kind of receded back, which was the, the style of the time. Women would actually pluck out their eyebrows and that front portion of hair. One of the things that has made this work very popular is because they're intrigued by it, that we really don't know who this woman was, and you have that term, that Mona Lisa smile. She has this slight smirk on her face that makes the viewer often wonder what she's thinking about. Does that make it good art, that we're intrigued by it? All right, how about this one? This one is called The Better to See You With, My Dear. It is also an anonymous, and it's an oil on canvas. Now, with this work, usually students have varied reactions. Either they like it or they absolutely hate it, that it's weird, it creeps them out. Other students say, well, I'm kind of intrigued. I want to know what's going on here. The bright colors that are used within the work might seem pleasing. And then how about this painting? With this painting, what feelings do you get from this? This seems like a very warm, possibly happy place. We have lots of light pastel colors within it. It seems calm and tranquil. 
something good is probably going on in these houses. Look how every single window is lit up and not just with a light, but a warm golden light. Every chimney has smoke coming from it. It gives, a, gives most people a feeling of, of comfort that this would be a nice place to go and to relax. This is called Cobblestone Bridge and it's by Thomas Kincaid, 2000. It's an oil on canvas. Now Thomas Kincaid, some of you may have heard of him. Um, he actually died a couple years ago, but he was a very, very famous American ar artist and very prolific. He would create work after work after work and people love them. Why? Because they had this warm, welcoming sense to them. He understood what people enjoyed within a work of art. And these show up on everything. They're on calendars. When we used to have mouse pads, they're on mouse pads. They're on cups. They're on mugs. You're, they're even on t-shirts, on purses, everything like that. He even does a Disney line where you have the princess usually standing with her prince on a bridge with the castle in the background. Now these are very, very pleasing to most people, yet they were mass produced. The fact that a work of art is mass produced, that you can cheaply get a print, does that change how we value it? How about this work? Somewhat similar to the work before, yet here definitely different. Bright color palette again, seems very calm, but there's something almost cartoonish about this one. If you look at it, it probably did take a level of skill to create this work. However, do you know what this is? It's a paint by number. Paint by number, you can still buy these in craft stores today. What happens is someone else takes an image and they create a grid like you see here with the giraffe. And then they tell you where to paint. So wherever sixes show up, you look on the other side, you see what color six is, and you paint, put that color paint there. That's what this work is. So does that change it? Is this person a good artist, or are they just a really good colorer? Who is the artist in this work? Is it the person who actually paints it, or is it the person who originally created it and then created the grid? Does that change how you look at the art? And then what if I take this, looking at the giraffe again, what if I take this image and say, no, I don't agree with what colors you want there. I don't want a tan giraffe. I want a green giraffe. So everywhere there's the number six, what if I painted it with eights and made it bright green? Does that make the work then more mine? Am I more of an artist? Or am I just breaking the rules? How about this one? This one is called In the Cat's Mouth by Pangorda. It's an acrylic on canvas. Again, people usually have pretty strong reactions to this. Either like, no, a five-year-old could have done this, therefore the technical skill's not there, or sometimes people are intrigued by it. Like, what's going on? Why is there this giant cat eating what looks like to be a human being? Now think about the value of this. For those of you who said it looks like a small child did it, well, if it's not your child, probably doesn't have much value. But what if you are the parent, the aunt, the uncle, the grandparent, right? What if it was a little kid you used to babysit, and then they created the work for you? Now we add a le level of emotion to the work, that it has a deeper meaning behind it that's not just the artwork, but how and why it was created. Here we have another work. It's very abstract work. Is this good art? Bad art? We could talk about lines, colors, possible meanings within the work. Or some of you may think, well, the technical skill's not there. A five-year-old could paint this, therefore, no, it's not art. How many of you are thinking, well, I could do this and I'm not an artist? Well, if you could do this, maybe you are. Remember this painting. We're going to come back to that in next week's uh, lecture looking at the elements and principles of composition. Here's another artwork some of you might be familiar with. This is American Gothic by Grant Wood, 1930. It's an oil on beaver board. Here what we see, it's the idea of trying to capture the American family. Um, many scholars have said that he's trying to what Wood was doing was trying to show the American family during the Great Depression. Wood himself actually said, no, that's not true. That wasn't what I was trying to capture. 
And in fact, this is a very staged painting. It gets its name American Gothic from the window that you can see in the background of the town of the house. The, how that window is constructed, that's a Gothic arch. And then here, the two people that are here, some people think husband and wife, very stoic, maybe father and daughter, when in fact, the woman is his sister and the man is his dentist. He just had them pose for him for this work. All right, what about this one? This is Balloon Dog Magenta by Jeff Coons, 1994 to 2000, made of stainless steel with a transparent color coating. Here, very fun, very whimsical. And he would take these large balloon animals and he would stick them in front of places that seemed very austere, very stoic within there. And so he's intentionally trying to break up this atmosphere. Does that make it art? Here we have another work created with pointillism. If you look at this one very, very closely, you can see it is again made with those tiny, tiny little dots. So lots of skill, lots of time, lots of effort put into this. In fact, this is painted by George Surratt, 1884 to 1886. It took him over two years to create this. And it's called A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte. If you think back to our Sundays on the Pot with George, the title of that is clearly referencing this earlier work. Here we have Madonna and Child 3 by A. Fontaine, 1957, and this is an oil on canvas. Here, again, the subject matter should be very touching, right? That's the intention behind it, that we have a mother and a small child. How many of you think it's supposed to be a representation of maybe Mary and the baby Jesus, thereby giving it a level of religious meaning, iconography behind the work itself? Does that make it good art? And then how about this work here? This is called The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living, created by Damien Hirst, 1991. It is a tiger shark within glass, steel, and formaldehyde solution. And this is a real shark. Now let's talk about artist's intention. When Hearst created this, what he was trying to do was he's trying to give the viewer an experience most of us will never and hopefully will never have in our lives. So if you stand at the front of it right before the shark is coming at you with his mouth open, it's the moment before the shark is going to attack. Now, if this was happening to you in real life, how would this turn out? Probably not the greatest. So what he's trying to give the viewer is he's trying to give the viewer an experience that they can live through. One that if it happened in real life, they probably would not. And so it's supposed to be that moment, right? That moment right before death occurs. Now, this may change how you view the work. The tiger shark is a real shark again. This is not just a shark he found on the beach. He had specific size and type of shark he wanted for this. And then he hired somebody to go out and catch it. So the shark, they went out, they caught it, and they killed it for this exhibit. Does that change how you view it? That something live was created for this? What if it was something like a puppy that was in the case? Would that change how you view the art? Next, let's look at monetary value in an artwork. This is Edvard Munch's The Scream, 1893, oil, tempera, and pastel on cardboard. This is also known as De Shrill de Nature, which means the scream of nature. And there are actually four versions of this work. Three are in museums, and the one here was actually sold in auction in 2012. And it was sold for $119 million, almost actually $120 million. Does that change how you view the work? What's going on in this? How many of you at first thought, nah, I could paint that? But there's a lot going on within the work. It seems intriguing. The colors, part of it very, very bright. Other parts, very, very dark. Yet, does that still make it worth almost $120 million? This is oil, paint, tempera, and pastels on a piece of cardboard. So does monetary value change how you look at the work?
Here's another piece most of you are probably familiar with. This is Michelangelo's David, 1501 to 1504, made of marble. Now, what about how the artist intended the work to be viewed? When Michelangelo was commissioned to create the David, it was supposed to be on top of the dome of the Florence Cathedral. However, when he was done creating the work, the powers that be said, no, no, this is too beautiful. We can't put it up on top of the dome. We want people to be able to see this from a closer angle. So instead, they put it on a small pedestal within the Plaza Vecchio in Florence. There it stood for years. Now it's actually in the building behind the plaza um, in the Academia, and there's a copy of it standing in the plaza. So Michelangelo never intended for the David to be seen this way. Does that change the art if the artist's message and purpose has completely been ignored? And then we have this work. This is what's called Fountain by Marcel Duchamp, 1917. Now there's a story behind this one. As you're looking at this, think about it. What is it? It's a urinal. So there was a show. Marcel Duchamp was already a very famous artist. He is um, a painter and a sculptor, most often known for his ready-mades. And that's what this is. That is what Fountain is. It's a ready-made. So there was an art show, an exhibition coming up. And he submitted this work to be in the exhibition, in the show. He took a urinal, put R. Mutt on it, and then the date, 1917, and submitted the work for the show. Well, what do you think happened? It was rejected. They said, no, this is not art. However, what happened was it got leaked that this was actually a work by Marcel Duchamp. What do you think the people who ran the show did then? They accepted the work. Why? Because they wanted a work by Duchamp within their show. Well, this actually proved an argument Duchamp was saying. He made the claim, it's not the work of art itself. It's not the end piece that's important. It's the artist and the process that they go through that makes the work. And this kind of proved his claim. If you think about it, the object itself never changed. It was always the urinal with R. Mutt 1917 on it. The only thing that changed was then they became aware of who actually created it. And since it was Duchamp, it was then considered art. Interestingly enough, this, this work is considered the most influential work of the 20th century why it challenged how and why many people looked at art. And that's what I want you to think about with this lecture. Next week we're going to look at more of how do we judge art and we'll look at formal and contextual criticism. But the point of this short lecture is just to get you to think about how and why you judge art. What is it that makes you think something is art and what makes something good art compared to something being bad art? because you do know a lot about art, whether you realize it or not. Okay, so we will pick up with that idea of how we can judge and criticize art in the next lecture.